Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ariel Tan from the Malaysia program at RSIS. Welcome to this webinar on the Johor state election and its implications for national politics. UMNO has just won a landslide victory in the state election on 12 March. It's second after the Malacca election last year. Momentum seems to be with UMNO Barisan, and this will be the key argument for holding the GE as soon as possible after Ramadan. But will things go as smoothly as promised? Within two days of the Johor election, the triumphant UMNO had to let go of their Menteri Besar candidate, Hasni Muhammad, and accept the appointment of a less experienced assemblyman by the Sultan of Johor. More instability is expected. In fact, we regret to announce that Datuk Nur Jaslan could not join us today as he has been called away to deal with this matter. Our webinar today will focus on the analysis of the Johor election and what it says about voter disposition, the concerns and priorities of specific groups of voters, the dynamics for cooperation and competition between BN, AMNO, and parties from Pakatan Harapan and Perikatan. We are honored to have with us two seasoned researchers who have conducted opinion polls and analysis of countless elections. You would have seen their bios, but briefly, Dr. Hamidin Hamid is Associate Professor at the History Department of University Malaya. He is also Research Fellow at Ilham Center, which conducts independent research on Malaysian politics. He was the founder and CEO of the Razak School of Government from 2010 to 2016, He's an expert on Malaysian politics, administration, and international relations. Ms. Fui K. Sung is CEO of the Center for Strategic Engagement, SENSE, the Public Policy Advisory and Research Unit of SENSE Media. She has worked in research for the last 20 years and specializes in combining ground research with identification of market gaps and client needs. She headed in sub from 2004 to 2008, and was the first Malaysian to head the American Malaysian Chamber of Commerce and Chen. Our speakers will each make their presentations. We will then go into a roundtable discussion, followed by a Q&A session. Please send in your questions using the Q&A function. This event is recorded and may be made publicly available later. Um, and now may I invite Dr. Hamadin, please. Thank you, Ariel. Okay. Um, fellow finalists, um, and first of all, I think I would like to say uh, my thanks to RSIS for inviting me to be the panelist today. Uh, I think everybody in Malaysia, obviously, for the past, I think, one week, still talking about the same thing, your state elections and what happened in the Menteri Besar. So I think I'm honored to be invited, and hopefully I can throw some light on what's happened uh, uh, during the elections and what, from our opinion, especially uh, from our Ilham and also from the university on what's happened in the last couple of weeks in, in, in the southern state of, of Johor. All right, uh, as mentioned by Ariel just now, uh, my name is Hamidin. I'm in uh, lectures in the University of Malaya at the same time. Uh, I'm a research fellow at the Ilham Center. We are very much a, a strong, uh, small group uh, of uh, researcher. Our concentration is very much on the on the Malay areas of the voters. So hopefully I can throw some light uh, on what happened to the Malays uh, uh, voting patterns uh, during the those state elections. Okay, I will share my screen now. I hope everyone can see the screen here. In terms of my some of my slide, I I, I think what I'm going to give is very much about the background on, on your state election uh, and also to combine some data that we have from Ilham during our survey. Uh, as a background, we do conduct our survey we face-to-face. Uh, -face. We only do face-to-face -face survey for Ilham. Uh, we conducted uh, with uh, around 1,300 uh, respondents this time. Uh, it took us around three weeks to four weeks to complete the survey throughout the, the elections. It started before the nomination and uh, after the nomination and, and during the campaign. So what we're going to talk uh, today is very much about 
the Yoast election, what does it mean uh, for AMNO and Barisan National? The title of my uh, of my presentation today basically is a uh, derived from the Malay uh, proverbs. We call it Jong Pecha Yu Kenyang, meaning rack ships and shark is full. Basically, it's just a literally translation uh, about about the words. What is said is very much because uh, in our prediction that we published uh, on Friday, uh, just before the, the voting days on Johor, we uh, estimated that at that time, uh, Barisan National was comfortably leading in the 35 seats and we are expecting them to have two thirds and our numbers then was 42. That uh, finally, I think everybody know the result now, that BN get 40, uh, uh, 40 seats. So we missed two seats, which for us, the mistake was from Maharani uh, and also from uh, Bukit Kepul. That's the two seats that we made a mistake in, in, in our prediction. So basically, the title is for us is very much um, apt to the situation in Johor uh, last, last week, where this uh, fragmented opposition, I think, will make things easier for Barisan National to, to regain the tutor. I think that's, that's basically what I uh, try to say. So some background, I think, on the state elections. Uh, Everybody is, I think, familiar with uh, what's happened, recognize this. I think it started with Perak, the changes of the state government in Perak, and then followed up by the Malacca uh, and also Sarawak uh, state elections. Give a very strong uh, kind of momentum, confident for AMNO uh, to gain, uh, to, to get back the trust of the people. So that's why, in my point of view, why AMNO, despite there is an MOU between the uh, Barisan National and other parties uh, to upheld the the stability of the state uh, uh, assembly in Johor, uh, but they decide at the end of the day to, to dissolve the, the, the state uh, assembly and calling for uh, general elections. And at the same time, I do believe it is part of the strategy for uh, AMNO to squeeze the federal government, okay, to make sure that uh, uh, what they want as a as a uh, party that they get in terms uh, of uh, dissolvement of the, of the parliament as soon as, as possible. So the stage was set up. I think very uh, many uh, historical thing in this state election. Okay, we have around 2.6 uh, million uh, voters with around 760,000 new voters, 11 political parties. Okay, we have 239 candidates. I think one of the largest in, in Johor state election history. Okay, the oldest will be the 71 years old and the youngest is 26. I think you can see the age uh, group in terms of that. 18 to 29, we have eight candidates. 13 to 39, 52. So you can see which number, which group they represent a big number. And at the same time, because of the numbers of the candidate and the numerous uh, political parties that involve, uh, we do have uh, many corner fight. I think the the, uh, the smallest number is three corner fight uh, in, in the whole state, like, which is uh, seven uh, a place the constituencies uh, with three corner fight, and we have four corner fight in most of the areas, and then we have five corner fight in eight uh, uh, constituencies, six corner fight in four, and the famous two, uh, seven uh, uh, corner fight. All right. Oh, I think I sorry, uh, Ariel. I have a problem. I think I I use the wrong slide. Can I redo the slide? Yeah. Hold on. Let me. Sorry about that. All right. <clears throat> so this is basically the general information. Are you into full slide? Sorry, full mode. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. All right. Okay. So this is very much uh, the stage for for the uh, for the for the elections. I think this the information is there. Numbers of the voter, um, voters, the dates, and 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 others. All right. And you can see on the left side of the screen the uh, the new voters. How many of them, and then the uh, voters by ethnic, uh, uh, the Malays, Chinese, Indian, and, and others. Obviously, this is interesting about Johor when people say Johor represent very much on Malaysia, especially on the mixed area. This is it where uh, I think uh, Malays is only consists around 55% of the voters uh, uh, in the state. 
and this is by age uh, in term uh, in term of that uh, where the, the youngest one and the, the, the oldest one okay okay numbers of the parties that's involved in the in the state election right and then the the bona fide that uh, i mentioned just now right So this is uh, interesting. I think that on the on the left side of your screen, you can see the number of registered voters by age. I think this is where uh, why, uh, if you look at the situations uh, uh, in the couple of days ago when Hassani said he want to hand it over the leadership to the young, I can you can see the first uh, three panel there is around uh, 50 percent. It's very much uh, below uh, 40 uh, in 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 Johor, and that number definitely will raising up. And you can, if you plus uh, to the 40 to 49, so meaning most of the um, um, Johor voters are below 50 years old. So I think this is very interesting to look at. And at the same time, uh, on the right, you can see the numbers of the candidate increase almost twofold to 239 in 2022 compared to only 158 in 2018. Okay, and interestingly, uh, gender also there is increase. In terms of gender, we have 37 uh, female uh, candidate uh, compared to 202 for, for the male. All right, and this another summary of the uh, parties uh, that we mentioned just now. Okay. And this is the result uh, of the of the uh, uh, state election. If you can see through the numbers, where uh, I think very interesting to to see. For me. If you look at this uh, map, it is important to note that on the right side, what we call it the east coast of Johor, okay, at the top there, N22, uh, Endau, uh, owned by Perikatan Harapan, this area is very much the blue okay, area, which is the Malay, uh, ultra Malay uh, numbers there. Most of these areas are 70% and above Malay waters and used to be very strong, and I think still. A strong amno um, uh, presence in the in the state, but interestingly, in this state election in N32, there you can see the numbers here uh, is captured by by Bersatu, by uh, Perikatan Nasional. Okay, uh, when I do the analysis in the areas, uh, we do conduct some survey in the areas. We see this is where there is some uh, sort of changes among the voters, even in this hardcore. Uh, Amno areas where I think people start looking at the candidate rather than to the party. So it's a very much contestation between the personalities and parties that happen in N32. Uh, and uh, here is we have Bukit Kepong and also we have Maharani uh, uh, owned by PAS and Bukit Kepong. And PKR is in Bukit Batu in this area. And the rest is very much the AP and one uh, Putri Wangsa captured by, by Muda, the sole. Uh, 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 representative of uh, Muda in the uh, in the uh, last last election. So with this map, I think you can see to some extent where uh, uh, Pakatan uh, Pakatan Harapan lost, and actually in the southern coast uh, of Johor, right? Uh, in most of this area, in the southern part, used to be very red. Okay, I think this is where uh, the stronghold of uh, Pakatan Harapan and. Uh, I think now is very much swing. Then that is something that we we will discuss uh, today. Okay, so this is very much interesting to see. What's the voters, as Ariel mentioned just now, uh, what's the voting pattern means and and others. If you look from the popular vote, as far as that uh, we we are still uh, working on the on the data that uh, emerged from state elections, but obviously Barisan National uh, win uh, forty three. A percent of popular votes, but captured seventy-one percent of the seats. That's interesting because of Malaysia first past the post system. Interestingly, is about Perikatan National. Okay, Perikatan National gained twenty-four percent of the vote. Huge, huge uh, gain. Even though they only managed to get three seats, but in terms of the numbers of the vote, they beat uh, uh, Pakatan Harapan. Okay, I think that is something. The fact that they have to be recognized by Pakatan Harapan. Why we split between Pakatan Harapan and PKR? Because PKR contested under their own logo. So we, we are basically on the, on the logo. Even they work together, but for us, they work separately because they were 
contested under the, under separate logo in that in that sense. Okay, so in, in that uh, we will explain later where uh, Perikatan National gain most uh, of its support in term in term of that. Right. Sorry, and and here we see also number of seat that win by by the uh, by the parties. You can see uh, Amno. I think Amno can form their own government even without MCA MIC as a simple majority. They get 33. MCA, I think most of the people say MCA coming from the death. I disagree with that uh, because for me, even uh, despite uh, the high numbers of Chinese voters goes to Pakatan Harapan in the 2018, Johor still, in my point of view, shows some indication that strong support towards MCA are still from Johor. So I think uh, for me, uh, Johor is very much a good uh, um, voting ground for, for MCA. MMIC get three seats. I think they added one uh, compared to two before. Okay. Parti Bangsa Malaysia, I think they lost not only didn't get, but most of them lost uh, their deposit. I want to gain one uh, through, uh, uh, I think, uh, in uh, Simpang Jeram. Okay, that's the one to see the not win by, by Amana. And the AP get 10. Uh, Chintong win in Perling, Marina in Skudai, and, and, and many others. PKR in Bukit Batu with a very slim majority. Okay, less than 500 majority. I think that. Muda, I think, uh, most of the interesting to analyze the, the voting in Muda. Okay, how, in my point of view, he managed to capture, especially among the non Malay. So, the non Malay voters, I think, definitely among the Pakatan Harapan move from uh, Basatu before and move to Muda. I think this is interesting looking at the, at the young uh, or the future politics uh, where I think the advantage of Muda candidate here, she can really articulate the policy and, and politics at the same time. That is the very advantage. Uh, to her in, 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 the, in the country. Warisan gain nothing, and Basatu get two, and PAS, I think, first time, yes, PAS used to have a, a representative in state uh, 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 assembly, but never in a competitive way. This is the first time I think PAS won the uh, state election in the competitive way to some to some extent. Yeah? So I think this is where I think uh, when I, we were talking to the PAS people uh, post-election, most of them are very happy. In fact, during the campaign, I was surprised during the campaign of um, uh, uh, PN, past missionary was very active, very, very active, and they are very good. And even from our state came and, and support. And that, I think, helped Basatu tremendously uh, in, in terms of the campaign. I think that uh, because Basatu, I don't think, have a, a smooth uh, and oil missionary compared to past. In that, in that sense. Uh, and others, I think, Gerakan didn't get uh, any seats. So to Pujuang, PSM Putra, and, and Independent. Right? Okay, this is the age uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the winners, I think on the left. So you can see uh, the majority of uh, uh, in the uh, state assembly now is basically below uh, 50. It's very interesting. And 15, uh, female uh, will be in the sitting in the in the uh, uh, in the uh, state assembly. Okay, and this is some uh, general uh, point of what we were saying just now. You can see uh, one of the biggest deposit loss happened in Johor this time. All right, eighty five, and for you can see the highest is basically half of that coming from Pejuang. Pejuang's uh, place forty four. Uh, candidate in 44 seats and they lost all and, and uh, lost all their uh, uh, deposit then. So you can see uh, in Bukit Batu, okay, Skudai, uh, even though this is interesting, maybe Ms. Pui can explain later on. Uh, Skudai, even though there is some problem, people said faced by uh, internal problem of uh, DAP there, but uh, Marina still gained quite good number in terms of the majority. Looking at the uh, uh, to now, yeah. At the same time, I think the smaller majority is is by uh, PKR in Bukit Batu, only one hundred and thirty. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think for the next two slides, I just uh, I know is only how many minutes left for me, Ariel? Five. Um. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. I try to adhere to the time as as much as I can. 
All right. I think what's the result mean? I think this is most of us, we want to, to see, to analyze in terms of that. I have to admit that for us at Ilham, we are still crunching the data. Okay, I think uh, hopefully in a week or two, we can we can finish the data, but uh, so far that we can see the data give us some indication. First, I think it's very clear that for the Malays, especially for the Malays and to some extent to the Chinese, we notice that PN is a clear alternative for Barisan National. They not only see that, but I think they're accepting it now. I think that is very important point that we want, we want to look. You can see from the popular votes that they can get. That's one thing. The second point, as I said just now, in the blue line of East Coast, normally it's very difficult for opposition to gain. Okay. Yes, we can see the crack happen in 2018, especially in the deep field areas of Lok Heng, in Kota Tinggi and others. But this time around, we can see there is a uh, not only they accepted and the, uh, the and the uh, Prakatan National can do their campaign there, but they gain a lot of support in Johor Lama, for example. Uh, Basatu candidate there gain around six thousand, almost seven thousand votes, which is surprise us when we do uh, when we uh, survey that area. We thought you can get around three to 4,000 and you get almost double. So we can see there's a big trickle moving towards uh, Prikata National. Okay. So especially in the rural area, the way we notice in the, in the, in the, east, in the east Coast, we notice that PN is the only choice other than Barisan National. I don't think uh, Pakatan Harapan has always been the problem there. Imagine in, in N32 in Endau, I think Pakatan Harapan almost lost their uh, deposit there. It used to be a very strong, but you can see the pattern there. Okay, The pattern there where, this is another second point of uh, ours that most of the Malay votes who vote Pakatan Harapan is similar like in Malacca, now voting for Perikatan National. Okay? Most of the Malay votes they vote for Pakatan Harapan before, now voting back to Prikatan National. They didn't go back to Barisan National. Even in Melaka, in Melaka, our data shows Barisan National only gained around 4% of the protest vote, but 11 taken by Prikatan National. And, I, and we assume now, I only said we assume, and we estimate the numbers is bigger in Johor, where the numbers go to Pakatan Harapan. Uh, Perikatan National is uh, bigger. And at the same time, interestingly, in the semi-urban area also, Perikatan National through Gerakan, through Gerakan get a lot of support. In some areas, they even get more than Pakatan Harapan, which used to be. These seats normally belong to Pakatan Harapan, but now is a, is a contested, uh, contested by Perikatan National. What from our... Um, survey and our focus group discussion, we notice among the non-Malay, even though when we ask the big question, can you trespass in Prikata National? They didn't trespass, but they see Gerakan through the eyes of Prikata National, through eyes of Muhyiddin, as, 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 as a man for them. So that, that's interesting for us to see the, that dynamic. And I think one point that I want to emphasize is similar to Malacca, we notice the voting pattern of 30 to 39, 20 to 29, meaning that group of below 30, below 40, is very much go to Perikatan National among the Malays. Okay, among the Malays is very much go to Perikatan National. The early data that we work on Johor indicating the same pattern is happening. Okay, the same pattern is happening. And this is not a surprise to some extent because in our focus group, and I mentioned just now what is the most issues discussed by the voters in Johor, basically still bread and butters. Economy is a huge thing. Johor, for example, closely economically linked with Singapore. Everybody is waiting for borders to be open 
and to have to revive back that kind of uh, reciprocal economic relation with, with Singapore. And at the same time, COVID is there, but I don't think COVID was the main reason for the low turnout. I think the low turnout for us is very much the fatigue of politics. People are very much tired of politics. I think that is the main reason why people didn't turn out. In, in Johor, it's only 54.9% uh, voters turn out. So in our focus group, most of them, it's not about um, COVID, it's about fatigue and economy. Most of them, in their mind, is more about the economy, how they want to survive life, basically, especially among the small and medium. And this is an interesting point to note. When we talk among the Chinese, we talk about the among the Malays, uh, I care, small and medium enterprise. Most of them, in place of Muhyiddin Yassin when he was the prime minister, I think the handout given by during that time really give us give a positive spotlight to Perikatan National and, and Muhyiddin Yassin. So the last point that we want to put here is very much that the protest votes against Amno now move to Perikatan National. So which I don't think I'm even if they call for a general election soon, I don't think this this world will will ever come back to Amno. It is very much clear now that Perikatan National can be an alternative for for Amno. So for BN, what it means to them, I think they have to be really careful with the result. Even though they win forty seats, but only with forty three popular vote, and we look generally, okay, if we they combine the votes of PN and PH in this multi corner fight, BN will lose 36 seats. They only can win around 20. They can even form the government. I think that's a very big point that Amno Barca National must realize that. Okay? In terms of, um, I think the advantage, as we said just now, the fragmentation of the, of the opposition give the votes split. And that split, Benefit technically benefited the uh, Barisa National and low turnout also give an advantage for Barisa National because they have very much voters who's there. Okay, in the most of the rural area, I think they have the advantage in terms of that, right? And obviously, for me, the plus point for Barisa National is the machinery is oil oil. I think that is something that I always admire as a researcher. I always admire Barisan National when it comes to their machinery. MCA, MIC, and AMNO, they can really work together, organize. I think the most thing that we really uh, look at this time in Johor, we really follow toward the voting days, was how successful Barisan National was in bringing out the voters to the, to the uh, voting uh, areas. This is, I think, what makes the difference. For the opposition, they can gain uh, the interest of the voters, but stop there. But not for Barisan. I think the tradition of Barisan, they manage knock on the door, bring those people to the to the uh, voting uh, station and make sure they vote. I think that is the advantage of Barisan that very difficult for many parties to to work against. Okay. So what is next? I think. Yeah, everybody now is bracing for uh, general election, obviously. Okay, for AMNO, especially for Barisan National, especially for, for AMNO, I think is very good. Uh, they're full good. And then I think we can see that in the coming weeks, uh, not coming, coming days, this weekend, the uh, AMNO General Assembly is happening starting today. In fact, and throughout the weekend. And they, they believe they they get a good momentum from what's happened. And for them, they're already out of the wood. Okay, They are uh, managed to forget the ghost of the past, meaning 2018. I think they are very confident in terms of that. And for oppositions, our words is simple. Okay, for opposition have to admit, without corporations, forget about to win general elections. They better hand it over to Amno. Johor, a state election, I think, reveal that without a clear uh, cooperation between the parties, 
AMLO can, Barisan National can easily go back to power. So with that, uh, Ariel, I think I, I finished my presentation. I'm looking forward for the question and answer session. Thank you. My sincere apologize for the, for the mistake of the slide just now. Thank you, Dr. Hamidin. Um, before I go to uh, Ms. Pui, I would like to ask you some questions so that in the meantime, you could maybe think about them. The first question is on the fragmentation of the opposition. Um, so the logical thing is for them to work together or minimally uh, coordinate on seats so that they avoid multi-cornered fights. But we have also heard, especially the younger leaders of the opposition, DAP or PKR, you know, uh, raising questions about the value of a big tent. Mm -hmm. Because while it may be strategically clever, um, you may also demoralize voters in thinking that, oh, you could work with anybody. So uh, are you principled? The other reason for not, uh, you know, going too close with, um, uh, you know, the, uh, for the, the two coalitions, the opposition coalitions to work together is that perhaps, um, you know, some of the parties then may want to work with AMNO um, after the election. So there's that. And then also um, the, uh, um, yeah, sorry, I, I think I will, I, will, I, will, I will keep to that. So, so the, the, there seems to be um, um, some questioning about whether or not uh, doing something about this fragmentation is actually a good thing for the opposition. The, the people who want a principled stand may say, hey, actually this election, forget about it. We can't win. So should we continue to just stand on principle and then you know work, work on the next election? Because I think there's a lot of uh, feeling that perhaps the opposition just have a very low chance of winning in the in the next GE. So, so um, you know, that, that could be one reasoning. Um, the other set of questions I have for you is, um, what is the behavior of Chinese voters in Malay seats and the behavior of Malay voters in Chinese seats such that, um, you know, they end up helping uh, certain parties win, you know, running in those seats? Because, for instance, um, you know, if you have, uh, a, a candidate, a Basatu candidate, for instance, in Malacca, uh, mm. they fielded a Malay candidate in a Malay majority seat. The seat is supposed to be run by MCA. MCA and DAP lost to Basatu, mm. you know, even though traditionally it's supposed to be, uh, you know, monopolized by Chinese parties. Um, so that's the second question. The third question is, um, can you share a bit more with us about Basatu and PAS, their their dynamic, are they now, um, you know, uh, really uh, going hand in hand now uh, on pass side? Is it primarily Hadi Awang that is pressing for this? Because I think there is some, uh, also some some uh, doubt in AMNO, uh, in pass whether or not they should be working with AMNO rather than Bersatu. Uh, because Bersatu is Muhyiddin, but after, you know, apart from Muhyiddin, is this a, a vehicle that go far? Um, so I think um, the last one would be um, whether or not what you saw in Johor is actually uh, how, how where where does it not tell you anything about the national politics? Uh, I think it has to be emphasized that um, Johor is actually um, no stronghold. So clearly, this result cannot be repeated in many of the other states. So um, you know what. Uh, what, what are some of the, the things that happen in, in Johor that cannot really help us understand national, uh, the national situation? Thank you. Um, and may I, yes, um, thank you for the questions from the audience. And may I en uh, encourage more to ask questions in the Q&A uh, function? Um, and now may I please invite uh, Fui to uh, share with us your thoughts, please? Sure, thank you, uh, Ariel. Uh, can everyone see me and hear me? Yeah? Okay. Uh, I would just like to, uh, yeah, first of all, thank you RSIS for inviting me. Uh, and uh, I think you gave a very brief CV of myself. Uh, actually, the, the latest development is that I have been appointed back uh, in INSUB as the board of trustee uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So in a way that also helped me to gain a, a lot of insights as to how um, the BN actually campaigned during this time. Uh, after this long gap, you know, uh, since 2018 and so on. So it's been quite 
it is but it's been quite insightful so Charlene, if you could just uh, share the slides so that I can go right into it, because I already knew that uh, Prof Hamidin was going to share the, the background, the data and everything. So I did not uh, take the time to go and you know, repeat those things. But I think they're mainly, there are just four points that I'd like to raise in this webinar. And I'm speaking solely uh, not so much from the MCE viewpoint or BN viewpoint, but solely from the Chinese community viewpoint as to what they see, what they felt, how they felt, and what they want going forward. I, I think that is where I'm coming from. So I'm not speaking on behalf of any party, but I am. I think people are more interested in knowing what next for the Chinese community. And I get ask this question all the time. And I'm really presenting this, I'll, but basically I'm just using data to support what I want to say uh, is co a consistent campaign by Barisan National. That was really their strength. The fact that they have their voter base, they have, they know exactly where they are. They can go door to door, and like you said, as Prof said, uh, that on the on the voting day, on polling day, I think we went out there. My researchers were all out there, and it was virtually a very empty polling station, and we, I mean, everybody kind of just panicked. So I think by afternoon they were able to. Uh, get their voters out despite the uh, lethargic voting uh, sentiment that managed to pull uh, everybody, well, I won't say everybody out, but that really is uh, the BN's strength. And the fact that they were consistent, they had chiramas, it was well organized this time. Uh, kudos to, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, Mat in uh, for pulling the various parties together, I felt that the machinery was very well. There were no open fights. Of course, there always be infighting here and there, but it was very, very localized and very, very well contained. Uh, and basically at the end of the day, the central command and the line command was very, very clear. So, and the communication was good. And what you had on the other hand was a, a, a fragmented opposition. You know, you had many flags and people weren't sure what was going on uh, in some ways. You hardly even saw Anwar Ibrahim down there, except maybe for the last few nights, I think he turned up at this grand finale, Chirama. Uh, otherwise, uh, it was very fragmented, it, 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 even between PKR and uh, DAP, right? Muda, I think, worked a little bit better, but then again, they, they, they only have a few seats and they were really, Muda and DP were really focusing on two seats, Tenang and uh, uh, Puchugatsa. So they, they, knew, they, knew how to, they knew how to conserve their energy in some ways, uh, both DP and, and Muda. But otherwise, uh, the rest of the, the opposition parties, uh, including Barikatan in some ways, were not, I'll talk about Burikatan again, because I, I think it just reinforces what uh, Prof Hamidin was saying just now. So, okay, let's, uh, let's go into the slides uh, and you understand what I mean. Next, please. Yeah, okay. If you look at the, uh, the popular votes of the non-Malay parties, sir, because I know Prof Hamidin was going to cover more the Malay community. So I'm just going to focus on mainly on DP, MC, and, and, and Gerakan. Gerakan is important because it is part of Burikatan. Okay, it cannot be denied that as uh, uh, Prof was saying just now, Burikatan managed to get 24% overall, 24, although Karakan only 22.93, uh, but overall under the umbrella of Burikatan, they managed to garner 24% of the total votes. DP being much bigger, much larger, uh, better, better organized, bigger speakers, more speakers, more eloquent speakers, only to manage to get only around 20%. And BN, of course, 43, that's under AMNO. So you can see the trend there that from GE, uh, 
14 in 2018, DAP managed to get 18.9%. They managed to increase it marginally in Malacca, but it actually uh, uh, was reduced, very much reduced in Johor for DAP. MCA had great gain from 5.4 to 7.6 to 11.1. So where, where, where have they gone? You see, uh, I felt that, yes, in some ways, low voter turnout benefits the Barisan. I think most people think that, uh, yeah. But I think when it comes to super low voter turnout, it makes it very hard to project the numbers for three corner fights. From my experience in Johor is that because of the presence of Perikatan, whether it's PAS or Gerakan in there, it is actually very, very fine line. It was very hard to call because of the three corner fight and because uh, uh, the, of the very, very super, what I call super low turnout rates. When I say super low turnout rates, I mean less than 60 or less than 55, less than 60. 60 to about 65 with what I call low turnout rate. I think that is the sweet spot for, uh, for Barisan. Anything higher, you know that people are going to be swinging to the opposition. But any lower than that, when you have a three corner fight, you're going to be at a disadvantage. Okay, next. So just as uh, Prof was saying just now, and I've just given, just taken a sample of some of the seats where BN, MCA, DAP and uh, Perikatan contested under various parties, whether it's Gerakan, Bersatu, or PAS. So I gave a, a, a sample of what I mean by Perikatan is definitely the silent opponent going forward into even GE15. Again, because it's first past the post system, it is likely that they're not going to be able to gain traction in enough to win a general election because your resources are going to be stretched and so on. But I think there are just certain things that we need to look out for. Let's look at Germanta. Germanta was a seat that was contested by PAS, DAP and MCA. So MC, both MCA and DAP went into the campaign writing off PAS. I mean, I just want to be honest about it because they thought, why? I mean, it's a, it's a Chinese majority area. Why would anyone go and vote for PAS? Aya Garakan, never mind, don't worry about them. Uh, Perikatan, you know, they, they went in there, went in there because they locked horns because that was all they knew what to do. DAP only knows how to fight MCA. I can tell you, they don't know how to fight anybody else, right? You put AMNO there, you put PAS there, they, they are lost because DAP for decades only know how to fight MCA. Same thing with MCA. Maybe MCA is a little bit more experienced because they've been down. But same thing. The minute you see MCA, you, the minute you see a, a DAP, it is almost like two, two goats that have been locking horns for the last 50 years. Uh, they just know exactly what to do. And the moves is always like, okay, I push you, you push me, I push you, you push me. Same kind of thing. They totally lost sight of uh, uh, both parties totally lost sight of uh, PAS. Whereas Maimuna, I think in the first week, was actually, it was very interesting because you only had posters of ABBA. You don't even have posters of the candidate anywhere. So Amno told us, he says, hey, don't worry about it. We don't even know what the candidate looks like. Only posters are ABBA. How can people be voting for the candidate when they don't even know what the candidate looks like? So what has happened, is that I agree with Prof Hamidin, is that I think what it means, the fact that they can get 21% in Jamanta of the popular votes, and if I remember correctly, the only our, I think about 40 or 
of the only our votes, the military votes, the police votes actually went to pass. Mm -hmm. So what it indicates to me is that pass is gaining ground uh, and very, very, very much under the radar. The kind of campaign style is very much under the radar. And Jamanta tells me that story. Berko, for, okay, Berko, let's go to Berko. Berko also very interesting because Perikatan didn't put Gerakan there. What Perikatan did was they put a Chinese Bersatu candidate. Okay, so his pro he had been working there for quite some time. But what is interesting is that because it was his campaign was very obvious because he was uh, there was huge kema and then you have the jarama, then you have big uh, dinners and all that kind of thing. It looked very much like a barisan traditional barisan kind of uh, a campaign. That kind of alerted MCA. That kind of alerted uh, that alerted barisan. They knew what to do straight away. They went and protected the. The, the Malay the Malay ground so that was that was why that was why uh, Perikat, uh, Perikatan couldn't really um, uh, win in Berkok because of that. but even then it was a very very uh, tough fight okay it was tough fight. it wasn't easy to get that 51 percent no way uh, it, it was at, at some point we were also thinking hey you know maybe it wasn't so so easy after all so Joho Jaya and Berlin I would say it was very interesting because right from the start, again, because of voter uh, 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 um, uh, fatigue, MCA thought that the low voter turnout could benefit them against uh, Johor Jaya and Berlin. And they really were neck to neck. Okay, right from the start, they were neck to neck. Right, You look at that 17,000 votes versus 19,000 in a seat that is, has 100,000 voters. So this is really, to me, is very, very, very close. Again, MCA, Barisan and DAP, so used to locking horns, the way they know how to fight, they only know how to fight each other. Again, they totally forgot about Gerakan in both seats. And they still managed to get 8,000 votes. Now, how did they do it? How did Gerakan do it? Uh, a party that everybody says is dead cannot, be, cannot die again. <laughs> so again, where is the strength coming from? I believe it is also because of the past machinery, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because when we uh, followed the Garakan candidates in Berlin and Johor, I think he was just walking around, almost looked like he was walking around aimlessly in the Chinese areas, but actually under the radar, they were campaigning fiercely and seriously amongst the, the, the Malay community or the Muslim community in, in the way they know how, okay? So this is, I believe it is past. So uh, yeah, I, I think really, uh, I agree. I think going forward, Perikatan is going to be the silent opponent, not only in terms of splitting the Malay votes, but also in terms of how they're going to campaign uh, silently under the radar when 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 the two giants, so-called MCA and, and DAP, so used to fighting each other, they don't even know how to fight a third third legged kind of a competition. Okay, next. Okay, I think again I'm looking at it with my final slide. Uh looking at it really this time round, the Chinese are saying, yeah, uh, you know, economy is bad. I'm fed up. Don't want to come out to vote. And you're, you're right. It is not about, you know, pandemic and uh, not being able to cross the border and everything. I think it's generally just fatigue because people are so bogged down with, uh, with the economy and, and trying to recover and trying to survive and so on. So, and they realize, I mean, it, every time... It, Analysts or journalists will ask me, is this okay? So how many votes MCA, how many Chinese votes can MCA have? So I say it doesn't matter. DAP has 90, 95% of the Chinese votes and I couldn't do anything about it. And they're still looking for a Malay partner until today. So it's irrelevant, I think, this question uh, being thrown, uh, uh, you know, even, even to, to be discussed because it is, it is. Without a doubt, without a Malay leader, you cannot do anything, period. Right? Whether it is, uh, you know, Indian community or Chinese community. Okay, Sabah and Sarawak has got different dynamics, but it's also, hang also swinging that way. At the end, of that is, if that, that question is not settled, I mean, the Chinese community is also not dumb. I mean, subconsciously, they know. Yeah, 
So DP, what is your answer to me? So that was the thing that made them not come out to vote. Not because they didn't support DAP anymore. And I, I feel that they, I think in the hearts of hearts, I can put my, you know, my hand to my heart and say, look, okay, the Chinese community are still with DAP. I mean, that, that's how it is. But really, if you do not give me an alternative and who your Malay partner is going to be, I'm giving you my vote to so no use. I mean, that's what they're saying. Mm. So the first option that they, I mean, they have tried past, okay, in 1998, okay, anyway, that didn't work out too well, right? And then they tried again. Also, that didn't work. Don Mahade totally disappointed them in 2020 by resigning. Anwar, the, you know, the long, long trusted friend, tried and tested, and yet, he has not proven himself to be uh, uh, a leader that can command the majority of the Malay support in Malaysia. And that is a 20 over year kind of relationship. And that looks like it's going to probably break down very, very soon because PKR is also imploding from within. And I don't think they have actually recovered from the Sheraton move. So what do you do? Next thing is, okay, have recruit more Malay leaders, okay, in Penang, like Sharizan Johan and all that kind of thing. Cultivate Malay leaders from within the party that have done that. Still not quite successful. So because uh, Mal Malays that joined DAP, they call them bimbos, okay, or himbos, <laughs> because they think that DAP only get all the good looking <laughs> Malay girls, good looking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looking look, look, good looking boys and girls so okay muda and amana i don't think that's enough one seat two seat here and there it is the bridge too far okay so i think for g15 the leadership within dap or dap like especially are probably going to reach out again to muhidin and that possibly could be the political reality for them. Uh, whether Muhyiddin or Barikata wants to work with them or not is another thing. But I think that is in the minds of the Chinese community, they're pushing DAP to do that. Because one, they feel that there is no alternative. You cannot survive on your own. Otherwise, you're going to end up as the Chinese party and then that's it, period. And then you can fight MCA, this, 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 and then so what? It, it's not going to get you anywhere. So uh, Moedin is, I think we'll go into the QAA. Moedin, I think they, they're not sure about him 100% either uh, because during Perikatan when he was prime minister, he was seen as very much helping the Malay SMEs, not them. So that, that, is, that, was, that is my, my feedback from the Chinese community. Yeah. So, okay, later on, we can talk about, you know, what happens when a Malay candidate is, is uh, contesting under a DAP seat or a Chinese in a Malay seat. We can talk about that later. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Fui. Uh, that's a lot to chew on. Um, can I, you, um, you had focused on Malay leaders. And I think, that is reasonable in Malaysian politics because it is so personality based. Um, but apart from the personality, how about the parties? Because you can be the best, most convincing uh, uh, Malay leader, but you're in the wrong party. So clearly the personality of the party must mean something for the Chinese voters as well. So um, I'm just curious, um, what can a party tell the Chinese voters who are persuadable, okay? Uh, what can they say on race relations that would be um, enough uh, for the Chinese community? Um, I think Hasmi, uh, you know, he said a few things during the Johor election that was very significant. It was a hand towards the Chinese community. Um, we don't know where that goes now, but I thought that, that and that reflects uh, Johor's very mixed uh, constituencies. But I wonder if that is uh, relevant for the other parts of Malaysia. Uh, that's one thing. 
Um, um, so let's uh, let's maybe move to uh, Prof first. Um, thank you, Free uh, Prof. You're welcome. Yep. Yeah. Ariel, you, you want me to answer your question just now, yeah? Yes, yes, right, yes. Okay. I think uh, how fragmented and how can uh, what can be seen uh, for the opposition. Obviously, I think you can notice from the media in a couple of days, especially among the young in the Pakatan Harapan where they dismiss uh, the Pakatan National. But I do agree with uh, Ms. Pui just now that I think the only way for PH now is very much PN, they know that is the only way they can bring back, especially among the Malays. When Basatu went out of the uh, uh, Pakatan Harapan, I think they lost the Malay support to Pakatan Harapan very clearly. And Malacca give them indication of that. And Johor cemented that, that issues for them. Okay, so the challenge is, in my point of view, the challenge is very much with PAS uh, at the same time, how? But I do believe, I don't think they will do a, a coalition but I do believe what they're going to explore very much uh, mostly on the electoral pact, where they recognize in which area each parties are strong and to make sure that they are benefited from, from that area. I think, I think that is, uh, I do believe they will start from that kind of strength to strength uh, negotiation within, within the party. With that, I think it will, it will uh, give more one-to-one -one Contest uh, uh, seats uh, to be contested uh, in the in the next general election. So what I'm looking at now is not so much to to form a new coalition, but very much on the electoral pact among the parties, uh, especially looking at the uh, a space of uh, constituency where they can contest. I think that is what matters most among among the parties. All right. And then what's the behavior among the Chinese and the Malays, Chinese voters and the, and the Malays voters. I think this is interesting, as uh, we mentioned just now. Look at the Jamanta, for example, and others. You can see this is most of them go to PN, surprisingly, for the Malays. Okay? They go to PN. Among the Chinese, also they go to PN. We tested that in Yandao, for example, okay, N32, where uh, strong Google of Amno, very low turnout, around 50 something, but the candidate of Satu, Awia, uh, uh, they won with nearly 3,000 majority. And we managed to do some uh, early work in Andau in, in because we do follow. And he gained, I think, one of the highest Chinese vote in the in the area, around to, uh, almost 38%. So the Chinese vote go there. Looking at that, I think, but I have to say, it's very much depend on the areas to areas, consistency to consistency. What we learned about uh, Johor this time, I think, uh, is like we are handling 56 by election at one time. You can see it's very much localized. This is where uh, I think it goes to your your last question just now. There's how to understand that can be very much similar to the national politics. I think we have to be really careful. When we look at Johor, why? The narrative of stability was accepted. And uh, Hasni, I feel sorry for Hasni. He didn't manage to uh, to be the, the our uh, MB now. but because Hasni is a local face, so it's very much localized issues. Stability for the state and with Hasni and narrative of it, so it's very much localized issue that matters. I think general election will be different. General election where you can see the national politics, the one that, and, and the, the way the campaign, the wave, what we call it, the wave in the national politics is different, how it comes. And in, in state election, what we learn is very much localized issues. And this is where personalities much matters mm. in the mm. state election. Okay, personalities much really, uh, we notice, play a big role. So I think something that needs to be learned by political parties when it comes to the state election, especially in the uh, uh, state assembly, people are more familiar with the faces that they work with. That explains actually why, for example, Pajuang have a very good candidate. Okay, academic background, but most of them, all of them lost the deposit. Why? Nobody know them. Yeah. Nobody know them. How good they are, but nobody know them in the constituency. That's, That's right. the problem of Pajuang, I think. And in a short time of time, so I think uh, we notice that when we look at the uh, Pajuang candidate, for example, especially 
among the Malay area, most of them are professionals. Okay, good integrity and, and others. But at the end, not people didn't vote for him because of that, but mostly because people are not aware of the party. People are not aware of the existence of the, of the candidate. So personality does matter when it comes to the state, especially uh, uh, election. The future of Bersatu and PAS. Wow, this is very big question, actually. I think in, in, in this regard, I do believe uh, in most cases of Malaysian politics, uh, I remember asking uh, Tun Mahathir Muhammad the same question, how you describe Malaysian politics? And he said, personalized politics, which is, I think, is this very much, is between personalities, what matters, very much important. And Basatu and PAS, I think, riding high now because of that personal relation between Muhyiddin and Hadi Awang. To what extent that can be sustained is a big question mark. So too, uh, in my point of view, uh, the relationship, which is very much uh, not in a good position now between AMNO and, and PAS because of that relationship between Zaid Amidi and Hadi Awang at the same time. Mm. So it's very much personalized. But uh, looking at the things in Johor and looking at the things in Malacca, when we talk to some PAS people, obviously there is some critics in the past, uh, on PAS and that, uh, from PAS, but in Johor, for example, uh, in our focus group among the PAS people, they are very happy working with Basatu in Johor. They gain a lot. In N33, for example, in Tengaro, Felda Sip, uh, I think occupied by MIC for uh, almost uh, uh, since independent. But this time, past candidate only lost for 1,000 rather than 10,000 before. Yeah. So, so this is a very much like in Malacca, they, they lost Bamban only for 75 seats. Sorry, they lost Serkam only for 75 seats. Uh, 75 votes. So it's a huge, huge gain among the Malays for past while they're riding uh, I, Masatu. Yeah, I think for the Chinese, it makes a lot of sense even for past to go under the Perikatan um, uh, flag, I found. Yeah. Because it, it felt less threatening, yeah. you know, because the whole past logo, you know, the green logo against the white background, that has already been demonized for so long. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, and, I, and it's uh, very much the same uh, logo, you know, the, the same reaction that Malays look at rocket and then say, ah, okay, this one, Gina. But when you go under a perikat, uh, uh, Harapan, you know, it, it is it feels less threatening. So I think that is why in German time, in Tanka, you found that there was some Chinese mm. voted for uh, Maimuna, yeah, for example, yeah. in German, uh, German time, sim simply because it, it didn't feel like it was a past campaign, right? It was uh, it was it was Perikatan. And, uh, but I agree with you. I mean, whether that relationship is going to work or not between uh, uh, Muhyiddin and DAP, uh, that is, I don't think there's going to be a coalition. Mm. Yeah, some sort of electoral pact yep. could, work, could work for them. Yeah. All right. I think I, thank I, you. I, yeah, I saw that. I really, yeah. thank, thank you, Dr. Hamidin. And thank you, Fui. Um, Fui, do you want to answer my question on uh, whether or not party? Um, party slogan hearing or party agenda, right, on the race relation issue matters, or it is just personality. I, I, for, and you're talking from the chi uh, Chinese community. Yes. You, for them, I think they only recognize the AP. I think that for them mm. is, is primary. It, I think that still holds. Okay, that still holds. The problem is not so much a personality or, or what. It is now DAP, who is going to be your Malay leader? That to mm. me is the central question for the Chinese community. So long as you do not get a, a, a Malay leader that is moderate, that is uh, uh, respected and so on, you don't get my votes. Mm. So... It, that's a very tough question because in certain areas, especially DAP stronghold, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who who it is, as long as it's uh, DAP or as long as it's the party, that's all that, that's all they care. Only in certain seats, like for example, uh, Pekananas or Yongping, for example, mm -hmm. that was personality. Mm -hmm. That was because they saw the service and things like this. Uh, and that was, so at the end of the day, I think BN, unfortunately, MCA will still have to work like work like a dog still to able to be able to 
uh, overcome that 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 party thing. It, and perhaps in certain areas like in uh, Monkey Bowl or even in Ipo Barat, like, it doesn't really matter. No matter how hard you work, your votes are not going to go to MCA. That's it. I I I think I think uh, Ariel, it's it's hard to yeah, it's hard. It, it will, I think at the end of the day, it's still party. Personality, yes, it does work. Does work in certain areas because because the the DAP uh, Adun or MP is so terrible or whatever. It is because of DAP's weakness. Then only MC, I think, in certain areas will be able to overcome that party image, if you like. I mean, that is the that is the the reality. So they have to work a lot harder, generally speaking. So can I conclude that basically the Chinese are still supporting the AP and and the Malay leader that will go with the AP is is up to the AP, right? So AD, you know, if the AP is with uh, Mahathir, then you know the Chinese have to decide do they want to support this? That's right. You know, and and sometimes Chinese voters are not voting for a Chinese party. It's not between the AP or or um, uh, MCA, right? So they are they are scattered. But in the end, they will vote for the coalition that DAP is part of. From, mm -hmm. from what I understand from what you're saying, yes. generally. Yes. yes. And okay. which, which Malay leader you're associated with? I, I, I like to add what Ms. Poi mentioned. From the data that we gather from our, uh, especially among the Chinese, our, in our focus group discussion, very much reveal what Ms. Poi mentioned just now. For them, most of them say among the Chinese, they accept that they have to cooperate with Malay. They question it, which type of Malays that they think mm -hmm. that will represent the best for them. I think that is, mm -hmm. and this is where, in my point of view, the Malays also uh, political party right. realize that that they need. Right. For example, when we talk to the Prikatan people, they know uh, uh, in Malacca, Malacca teach them uh, they have a very small numbers of uh, Chinese vote uh, uh, go to go to them in Malacca. I think so. They work uh, 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 in different way and Gerak can play a bigger role in, in, in Johor, for example, and they can see. So this is where I think the issues of the type of leadership will become big issues in the coming in the coming election. I yeah. think so. So long as DAP is not able to present a, a, a Malay candidate, PM candidate, I think mm. it's going to be an uphill battle for them in GA15. People are either not going to come out or they, yeah. the ones that come out will vote for MCA simply because MCA uh, and BN has a very good, strong uh, voter base. Uh, it's still a solid voter base, although mm. it's not increasing organically as it should, but at least they have that voter base to go back to. I think that is what it really means. So long as they don't present a viable Malay leader, it is going to be an uphill battle for Pakatan Harapan. Mm. Mm. So Fui, you're saying that Anwar is not considered a viable candidate today, right? No longer, not in the last, mm. uh, not since, not since uh, mm. G40. Mm. I think mm. when okay. he was first released, and when there was a chance, when uh, P, when uh, Tuma Hadi resigned, I think there was a very, very strong move that he he should take over. Uh, but I think since then he's made a lot of pretty shoddy moves, and and that that has really, uh, um, I don't think he's ever going to recover from that. Okay, thank, thank you both. Thank you so much. Uh, we should move to Q&A now. Uh, but I just have one last question to sneak in first, which is, um, you know, we have noted the you know, voter fatigue, uh, voter, um, you know, dissatisfaction and sitting out so that the turnout is low. So can I ask you, if this happens in the general election as well, uh, what will be the impact on the parties? I think if, if it, that is the trend, then it goes without saying the end is going to win mm. for, for now. I mean, that, you know, although we keep saying that Perikatan is a threat, is a threat, but it, it, it is, it, it's not, not fast enough. Mm. It's not quick enough. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think we, mm. as I said just now, for us, uh, we doubt that clear cooperation between the, the parties, obviously, I think the end, hands down, we get the election. Hands down without yeah. that. Because yeah. it's very much a technical thing. Uh, when the vote splits, that's it. Uh, when yeah. we it's test in the hall, it's very much clear. That's it. If they split, I think BN will go through into all that. Okay, I guess we, we had your uh, almost last words on this uh, issue, which is BN is going to win in the next election. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, we, we would like to hear from our audience. So um, 
um, please, Nadia, uh, could you come on and uh, moderate the Q&A, please? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Nadia Issa. I'm a research analyst uh, with the Malaysia program at RSIS. So our audience have actually sent in a few questions and I'll be directing them to our speakers now. So I've seen actually Prof Hamidin um, privately replying, but for the benefit of the larger audience, I would have to re repeat the questions so that they, um, more people will know. So the first question is from Raymond Yi actually. Um, he wants to know if if the voter turnout was higher, similar with the last um, 2018 election in Johor, would the results in Johor have been different? Maybe Prof Hamidin may want to okay. answer this one. Yeah, yeah I think I, I answered that. Yes, definitely the result will be different. Mm. But the voter turnout is, 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 even in some of our uh, simulations, even the result for 70%, I think is going to be very tough for Barisan National. In Johor, in case of Johor. All right, mm -hmm. uh, is, is right. definitely, definitely make a difference in terms of that. Uh, but it depends on the areas though. Uh, we have to consider back, depend on the areas. For example, in the East Coast, uh, as I mentioned, the blue color uh, uh, line of uh, uh, the Tinggi, Pengarang, the district, the turnout is quite good, around 60 something, 65%, 66% where by the national game. But for the Southern part and the West and the North, I think if the turnout uh, higher, I think you can see, especially the CPH is contested, like Parayani uh, in Batu Pahat, Garang yeah. in Batu Pahat. I think that will make a lot of difference for yes, uh, yes. Pakistan Arapan seats. Yeah, even for MCA seats as well, northern and southern, if there's yeah. going to be a very high turnout rate, that's going to be an issue. But I think not so much in the central region. Central mm -hmm. region is still okay. 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 Um, another question would be, with the win for Amno in Johor, would this change the dynamic within Amno itself? So, do we see a reemergence of Zahid and Najib versus the Sabri camp? Yeah, maybe Prof. Hamidin, you would like to. Oh, yeah, obviously. Uh, I think uh, obviously. I think uh, you can see even even from the media uh, reporting and others, uh, most of them try to put uh, the win into the the factors of uh, Bosku Najib. Uh, I think. I might be disagree uh, in that part because I don't think Najib presence in some of the areas that we went and follow him. Yes, it's good. Uh, the president was good, but he didn't he didn't convert into votes the way I will see. He didn't I, convert I, into votes. Okay, it's I, just it's just a hype for campaign. That, that's yeah, it us, was a hype yeah. for campaign. Yeah. yeah, I mean he can draw the crowds out and yeah. it, it's a it's a bit of a carnival. I think for the mm. Chinese areas also, it's very much a bit of a novelty. You know. Mm. Right. Okay. But, but obviously give a give a, a give a, a spotlight on both of them uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, definitely create more fractions um, I think uh, we did, we did that because of that yeah. okay okay the following question is from Isaac Leong he wants to know if there are now recently calls for Muhyiddin to resign will this actually affect the end's popularity in the future okay I think I answer that I think for yeah. me as simple as PN is moved in. Without yeah, him, exactly. I think, forget nobody about is gonna, forget nobody him. Is ask, nobody is going to ask him to resign, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like... And, I, and I don't think, I don't think uh, he wants to resign. Uh, and, and without him, that's it. PN will go on. Yeah. And it's like asking Tun Mahade to resign from Pajuan. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We have a question from Prof. Johan. So he wants to know whether was, more, was money politics a factor in the Johor polls? Why did Felda settlers not go for PN's offer to forgive 8.3 billion debt? Ah. Yeah. So maybe Prof Hamidin, you'd like to. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof Johan. I think this is a very interesting question. I think uh, what a PN campaign was is not only about to forgive. I think Mohidin reminded the settlers that when he was in the government, that things happened, that there that, that was uh, uh, settlers. I don't think it's very much uh, money politics when it comes to Felda. I think Felda is very much a strong, uh, is a tradition. It's very difficult for to, to penetrate where Amno is becoming part of life. There. That's the way we see it. it. It's very difficult to penetrate that. Every segment of life, I think, is, is kind of intertwined with the, with the, with, with, with politics, with, 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 with Amno. With that, I think it's, it's very difficult. But I have to say this. 
that may be in the uh, older generation. For the young and third generation, it's different. This is where the issues of water turnout is very important. I think most of them are sitting outside the work outside in Kilang, in Johor Bahru, whether they didn't go back for, for the voting. So you can see during the last election, some fell down uh, where uh, Pakatan Harapan gained good support. It's mostly coming from the third and second generation. The right. yeah, the younger right. but, yeah, the younger one. The younger but one. for this time, we noticed that most of the people, even in the federal areas, the one that vote is only the, the first generation. It didn't, they took an, the, the second generation didn't trickle down. Most of them didn't come back uh, to, to the fellow set, settlement to, to, to vote. So it's not so much of the money politics, I think. This, this time is very much the failure of the political party to really convince people from outside to go back and, and vote. Yeah. I think that's, that's right. I think, that's prof, right. I think Prof, uh, maybe perhaps, uh, I think Muda and mm. DP were trying to test that in Tanang. Okay, precisely mm. that whether the young voters will actually going to go to Muda instead of uh, uh, Barisan, and yeah, they nearly nearly succeeded actually yeah. because they only lost by uh, I think less than two thousand votes. Yes, and, and putting someone like Lee right. Wuki, who's a Chinese some more, you know, a, a, a urban bangsa fella sitting yeah, yeah, yeah. who's right in the middle of nowhere, and he still managed to garner this kind of votes is is really is very telling that the younger voters are actually going for uh, alternative parties and they're not going back to BN despite all the things that have done for, for the community. I, I agree with you. You can see at the two, uh, two areas, in Tenang, where Wajid uh, contested, and also Azrul in Bukit Permai. Both, you can see that this, uh, this is where I think when the, uh, the candidates, this is where I said just now, the candidate plays role. The candidate, because of the young, managed to attract the second generation uh, of Elda in that, in that area. So, yeah. I, I think in terms of age segmentation, I find that the younger voters are going for Muda, uh, Muda and parties like that. Whereas the reformacy generation, mm. you know, the ones that I say 35 to 45 who've actually went through the uh, PKR generation, the reformacy generation, did not go to PKR, I'm yeah. now going to Perikatan. I think that mm. is that is basically what it is. The yeah. older generation, okay, the top, okay, memang they have they're going back to uh, BN. The the reformancy generation are going to Perikatan, and the really young ones are mm. actually uh, going to Muda and other alternative uh, parties, uh, micro parties or emerging parties, if if you like. I see. Okay, we have another question from Chun Siang Su. He would like to know recently, there's this um, matchup and agreement on Hafiz. He has been recently sworn in as Johor Menteri Besar. So despite BN's pushback, so what is the impact of this on the future political environment in Johor? Maybe, Fui, you would like to take this? I think this is very much to do with the Johor Palace. I think that your next question should be, what is going to happen when he becomes Ago? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you know, no, if you can do this in a, in a Johor, so the, the, the question is, how much control is he going to uh, muscle his way through when he becomes Agong? I really mm -hmm. don't know. But yeah, he, he is somebody you have to contend with. I think it's, it's, about, it's, about, the, it's about the personality, it's about the Sultan. <laughs> Not I, about think, the I, think, I think it's a very interesting uh, question, in fact. And, and this is what uh, we gather so far when the things happen and we do some uh, session with uh, Amno politicians. I think this is where uh, leadership, is go back to leadership with Amno. I think the question is go back to leadership of Amno. Definitely we give a strong impact on leadership, type of leadership that emerged in Amno. I think this is a, a question that Amno really have to, to, uh, to solve. Uh, in my point of view, but at the same time, as Ms. Pui just now, people always forget another R uh, 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 in, in Malaysian politics. Royalty. So that is huge, huge impact, in, in especially in, in, in Malay politics and all that, yeah. Okay. Another question would be, will we see more instability or stability, considering that there, there will be, there's rumours of, you know, um, subsequent state elections going to be commenced in maybe Kedah or Tera. And then you also have people um, people in BN pressing for GE15 to be held earlier this year. So what do you think of the future trajectory? Will it be more instability or will it be more stable? 
now that you know UMNO is uh, having more than two thirds of the state assembly in Johor. Yeah. I think that having more state elections certainly gives BN the, the boost because if the voting uh, fatigue continues to be the way it is, I, I think they're going to have the upper hand. But again, like Johor, like uh, the Johor election is very much at the top level. It looks nice at the top, but there the undercurrents uh, is something else. So yeah, it cuts both ways, I feel. Prof, what do you think? Okay, uh, Nadia, I think generally, uh, I don't think um, there's instability that we see in Malaysian politics will be solved soon. Yeah. I think it will continue to be so. All right. Uh, socioeconomic development, I think political development, definitely we could make things continue. And I don't think uh, by elections, we solve that. Malacca, right. I think now is going back. Internal fraction in Amno. So the question is not just uh, among the constitution within the political parties. Within the political intra parties also becoming more and more interesting to look at. So I think uh, as a historian, I always say this, when we look at the Malaysian history until 2008, it's kind of boring some things. From 57 to 2008, it's nothing happened. You read the same, the same old, same old thing. But mm. since 2008 and now, wow. <laughs> yeah, we're really catching up. Huh? We're, we're really catching, catching up. up. We can, it's <laughs> just unbelievable. And I do believe it's going faster uh, in, in terms of that changes. So, so that instability brings ourselves to, to make that becoming part of our life. And, and not to forget, there's a war coming in Europe. Huh? Yeah. And it's yep. also Ukraine and Russia. And that is going to be another time bomb. Yeah. On top so, of on top of I all. think uh, I don't see if we, we settle. Uh, because that will definitely, at the same time, see a uh, great uh, problem within the party. So you can see, I think most of the parties now, big party in Malaysia facing that internal uh, intra-party issues. Yeah. Right. And then not forgetting also Sabah and Sarawak. I mean, Sabah and ah. Sarawak is going to have their own uh, dynamics. They're going to go closer and closer to Indonesia. And Sabah, same thing also. I think that whole uh, issue of autonomy is also going to unravel uh, uh, UMNO in many, many ways too. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much for your responses and your questions. Unfortunately, we can't get to all the questions due to time constraints. I will have to pass over the time now to Ariel for her to close the webinar. So Ariel, please. Thank you, Nadia. Um, we hope you have enjoyed yourselves and found this useful. I would like to thank our speakers and audience for giving us your time. Most of the audience stayed all, to the, uh, all through to the end. So we are really grateful to you. And it shows that our speakers have been uh, very entrancing uh, uh, researchers and uh, uh, analysts. So um, I'd like to thank also our events team for their wonderful support. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ariel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.